Welcome back to Understanding Economics. Up to now, we've had a whole economics course without a single supply and demand chart. Some of you may have found that refreshing. Alas, we're going to break that streak today. We're going to summarize and review what we've said so far about the boom-bust cycle with the aid of that icon of modern economics, the aggregate supply and demand chart. It looks all mathematical and stuff, but it depicts a simple relationship. The chart shows the interaction of two variables, price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal. It's either quantity demanded or quantity supplied, depending on what we're talking about. We recall that people seek to satisfy their desires with the least exertion. This suggests that if the price of something is higher, all else being equal, people will want fewer of them. And if the price of something is lower, all else being equal, people will want more of them. So the demand curve always slopes down on the chart. You can remember it that way. Demand and down both start with D. The supply curve tends to slope upward for the same reason. If something commands a higher price, producers will supply more of it and vice versa. But the supply curve tends not to be smooth. It tends to slope upward rather gently for a while until a point is reached where it climbs rapidly. It has a kink in it. Now why would that be? It's because production is limited in time and space. For a while, producers will be operating at something less than their maximum capacity. That means that more products can be made with only a small increase in the cost of producing them. But once maximum capacity is reached, say the factory is running as fast as it can 24 hours a day, then to increase supply beyond that point, you'd have to build a whole new factory. At that point, the cost of adding new supply rises rapidly. And eventually, you won't be able to make any more products at a given time and place, no matter how hard you try. In the long run, the supply curve gets closer and closer to vertical. An equilibrium price point is reached in a given market at which the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. Overall market conditions could change, which would require the curves to be redrawn, but in a given place and time, a market will always tend to seek that equilibrium guided by Adam Smith's invisible hand. If, however, something is fixed in supply, then obviously its supply curve cannot respond to changes in demand. Can we think of a factor of production that's fixed in supply? We've been talking about one all along. The supply curve for land is vertical. When there's increased demand, which we show here by the demand curve shifting up, there are no land factories to crank more land into production. So what happens is the price goes up. And that's what happens when a factor of production is fixed in supply. It started to occur to macroeconomists that these relationships exist not just in individual markets, but also in the overall economy. So in this exercise, we'll be looking at charts of aggregate supply and demand. The p-axis of the graph is the general price level as measured by an index such as the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. The q-axis is the overall amount output of goods and services on a measure of total output such as gross domestic product, or GDP. Aggregate supply and demand curves can shift due to various forces that affect the overall economy, everything from oil price shocks to new consumer fads to rumors of war. The ways in which these curves shift can help us to understand what is happening or might happen in the economy. It's worth noting that when things get better on this chart in terms of economic efficiency, our equilibrium point shifts down and to the right. In other words, you have a higher quantity of goods supplied at a lower price. When things get bad in our economy, our equilibrium price tends to shift up and to the left. The reverse is true. You have fewer goods produced at a higher price. As things start out, let's say, times are good. People have jobs, they're making good money, houses are being built, and parents are buying their kids lots of Christmas presents. People want more stuff, and they're willing to pay for it. So the demand curve shifts up. There's more demand for goods and services. Note the new point of equilibrium. Prices have increased, but only very modestly. Output has increased quite a bit more. If demand continues to be strong, though, it can shift the demand curve past that kink in the aggregate supply curve. In other words, the equilibrium point has shifted past that point that economists call potential output. When they try to meet this higher level of demand, 
producers, their factories are already running at full capacity. They have to build new factories, and thus the cost of meeting the new demand goes up considerably. Now, prices have increased that much from there to there, while output has only increased that much. The economy is entering what you would call an inflationary spiral. Economists identify two general kinds of inflationary pressure. This one is known as demand-pull inflation. The other kind is cost-push inflation. We'll examine that in a moment. There are various forces that can move the aggregate supply curve around as well. One big one is called a supply shock. Here, a relatively sudden increase in the cost of some widely needed material or resource causes an increase in overall production costs. This time, the supply curve shifts upward. It costs more to supply goods at any level of demand. And look what's happened to the equilibrium point. Prices have risen even as output has declined. This is the condition commonly called stagflation. And the associated inflation is termed cost-push inflation because it's caused by an increase in the cost of supply and demand. The high oil prices associated with the Arab oil embargo of the early 1970s is the classic example of this phenomenon. But any factor could produce this effect. For example, a sudden doubling of the federal minimum wage, all else being equal, could cause a supply shock. It's worth mentioning that now and then things can come along that shift the aggregate supply curve in beneficial ways. As we said, benefit is down and to the right. We would experience a positive supply shock if some widely needed resource suddenly got less expensive. If we were to find a huge new deposit of easily recoverable oil, for example, or if high temperature superconductors were to make electricity drastically cheaper, this would shift the AS curve downward, lowering production costs at every level of demand, allowing us to have a higher output at a slightly lower price. So that would be a beneficial supply shock. But we tend to worry more about the negative things that happen. If the bad supply shock comes at a time when boom times are already pushing prices too far up the curve, price levels increase precipitously with no further increase in output. And there we see this, the stagflation situation pictured. Not only that, it's also possible for there to be a decline in productivity which would shift the AS curve to the left and make matters even worse. What would cause such a thing? A misuse of existing resources. Perhaps the labor force turns out to be educationally unsuited to making productive use of new technology. Or perhaps social strife caused by racial or class conflict wastes the productive energy of workers. This is not a picture that macroeconomic planners would want to see. Neither alternative, inflation or recession, has much to recommend it. At this point, output cannot increase without prices going up much faster. Because you're already on, above the kink on the supply curve. And production would have to fall quite a lot before we would achieve much of a reduction in price levels. The economy depicted here is headed either for galloping inflation or, much more likely in a modern industrial economy, a recession. Demand declines, output declines, causing further lowering of demand, causing less output. Much of the pain of this process is illustrated on our chart, for we note that prices can de decline quite a lot without stimulating any increase in production. It would certainly be nice, wouldn't it, if some sort of benevolent supply shock could come along help things along, make it easier to produce goods, make labor more productive. Now let's think about how that could come about. The point at which the aggregate supply curve starts to ascend steeply is termed the potential output of the economy. This term is slightly misleading, however, because the economy is capable of producing more goods and services than that. If it does so, however, it will have to contend with higher prices. The rate of unemployed workers, designated as full employment, is revised periodically by government bean counters, usually upward. It is a difficult figure to quantify, for there are various conceptions of which workers are or are not part of the labor force. But in a period of full employment, at least 3 to 5 percent of the labor force is unemployed. This has been the case right through booming times. In January 2007, the unemployment rate was 4.6 percent. In 2000, it was 
We might wonder why everyone can't find a job at a time when demand is robust and inflation is low. Clearly, all the desires of all the consumers have not been satisfied. There are still things that people could be hired to do. Yet, if that last 4 or 5% got work, we'd run into that kink in the aggregate supply curve and prices would rocket upward. But why? There's been no precipitous increase in wages that would create a supply, supply shock in the labor market. And technological improvements, along with international trade, have lowered production costs. So what is it that would make costs go up? Something must be soaking up these increases in output and retarding productivity growth. Something must be going up in price a lot faster than the overall rate of inflation. In effect, land speculation creates a built-in supply shock that kicks in as economic output increases. This is a systemic retardation of the economy. It operates as long as there is land speculation, creating an underlying tendency toward inflation or recession. So land speculation is always the cause of economic downturns? Yes, indeed it is. There are any number of contributing causes, things like oil price shocks, consumer confidence crises, international trade fluctuations, natural disasters, but none of these things creates the underlying weakness. Land speculation retards the economy in two ways. It increases production costs by making land in general more expensive, which shifts the aggregate supply curve upward, as well as decreasing productivity by denying access to the best locations, which shifts the aggregate supply curve to the left and lowers potential output. In the same process, it also exacerbates sprawl, pollution, and waste of all sorts. In short, the gloom and doom tendencies we've been discussing here don't represent some sort of rare calamity of history. They are the normal state of affairs. The Georgist remedy, which came to be known as the single tax, and which we'll start examining in detail in our next few lessons, aims to remove the underlying problem that causes the boom-bust cycle. It would collect for public revenue the rental value of all land and natural opportunities, and simultaneously abolish all taxes on labor, production, and commerce. This reform would have profound benefits. A growing economy would no longer carry a negative supply shock in its wake because there would be no incentive to hoard land. Locations would be available for use when they were needed at prices that facilitated their profitable use. The speculative premium would be removed from land prices. Productivity would be increased across the board because the most desirable and hence the most valuable urban and commercial locations would no longer be held out of use. Henry George's analysis of political economy shows that the dual burdens of land speculation and taxes on production are not necessary, but rather are impositions on civilization that benefit privileged interests at the expense of the general good. The financial system, rather than being a root cause of these problems, emerges as a powerful tool that ratchets up these underlying tendencies. Removing these huge weights from our economy would eliminate our having to settle for a dismal trade between inflation and unemployment. Thanks for watching everybody. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science with videography by Ulad Dumer Takutu. Check his work out. Now it's time finally in our course to start exploring Henry George's remedy for economic ills.